We welcome you this morning to St. James Presbyterian Church on this first Sunday in Advent, and we're so glad that you are here in worship with us. Speaking of Advent, we have our Advent Festival this evening from 3 to 7 o'clock. It's going to involve a number of different things which you can find in the back of your bulletin. Among those are putting together wreaths. So if you have uh, different clippings from trees or branches or different things you would like to bring in, to help do that not only for yourself, but for others who might be in attendance, feel free to bring those at 3 o'clock this evening. You can drop them off out back, downstairs. And most of what we're doing is going to take place in the fellowship hall. We start off in the fellowship hall making these gingerbread houses, which my son has been telling me uh, all year this season that he wants to make one of Santa's houses and eat that. So he's super excited about that part. And then, of course, we have the making of the wreaths that I mentioned. We'll come upstairs for a time so that we can prepare for dinner downstairs. And when we come upstairs to prepare for that, we'll have carols, we'll have readings, we'll have some other things that will be involved at that time. So this evening, 3 to 7 downstairs. And in addition to what we usually bring, because we've completely remodeled the fellowship hall over the past year, we have new carpet. We would be uh, very happy if someone could bring clean tarps in so that uh, any of the things that fall, candy, branches, etc., on the floor, they're not going to make a big mess. So we invite you to, uh, to do that as well if you are willing. In addition, after worship today in the lounge, I'm going to have a relatively brief conversation with any of you who might be willing to serve communion to those who are shut in. Uh, This is certainly an important ministry in the life of any church, and we invite you to come and to be a part of that conversation and to reach out to those in our own church community in that way if you have the interest. Kara, you have an announcement for us. Yes, the ushers are passing out a blue handout to you this week. Last week, we handed out and collected the lovely prayer forms that you see in front of me. And there are more of those available in the narthex should you have not had an opportunity to write a prayer for the, I guess I should back up and tell you what I'm talking about. I'm coming to you from the Mission and Social Action Committee. We're discussing the Interfaith Coalition's Our House campaign, which is a campaign to add two more units of housing for homeless families in Whatcom County. So last week, we collected prayers for the volunteers who are building the house and the people, the families that will be living in the houses. Today, we are passing out volunteer opportunity forms, one side of which discusses hospitality. We are um, making opportunity available for those who perhaps would not like to get their hands dirty in dirt, but are willing to get them dirty in the kitchen and prepare Um, some snacks or treats or sustenance for those who will be working at the construction site. So if you would like to assist in that way, please fill out one side of the form. On the other side is for those who would like to touch some dirt. And uh, we're just kind of just for the office at Interfaith to better figure out who to ask when needs arise. We don't want to call everybody on a, a, um, a list if only three of the people have plumbing experience. So this just helps the office at Interfaith figure out who is best at what project so we can more accurately target volunteers when those types of jobs are needed to be done. You may turn this in, I don't know, in your offering plate or in the collection basket at the back of the sanctuary. And you may ask me any questions after church, should you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Also, in thinking about interfaith and the ministry that we're doing with them here in our community, we have an angel tree, which we have been supporting every year. That angel tree will be in the horizon room. That's the room overlooking the bay just outside of the narthex. If you want to go to that angel tree and find a gift or more than one gift that's listed on that tree, you would simply uh, take note of what it is that you're meant to bring, and you bring that, and all of those things will then be given to homeless families that are in the transition toward finding more stable and sustainable housing in our community. We invite you to be a part of that if you may have an interest. And... uh, 
our Christmas tree as well is another thing I should mention to you. Each year during Advent, we set up a Christmas tree right here in the sanctuary. We're going to be decorating that tree next Saturday. You can find the times listed in your bulletin. We're inviting those who are coming to be a part of that to bring some cookies so that the event's a little bit more festive. We hope that you can attend. Finally, there is a parent's night out. This is the first time that we have uh, tried an event like this in quite some time, uh, certainly as long as I've been here at the church. What we're planning to do is a pilot period of a number of months. We're going to invite those of you who would like to be a part of this to sign up. You can find the sign-up sheet in the Horizon Room where that angel tree is located. When you go, you can put your information down. Uh, This is the last Sunday to sign up for this Parents' Night Out before we open and extend the invitation to the Children's Co-op Preschool, which meets here during the week. It's a way that we can outreach to them and be of service to them as they are also major users of our space and a part of our community. So we invite you first to come and sign up, and then after that, we're going to broaden the sign-up. So... Please do think about that. At this time, uh, sorry, Carolyn, you have an announcement. As John said, it is the first Sunday in Advent, and in just a moment, we will, the choir will sing, the Advent candle wreath will be lit, and the um, communion table candles will be lit, and then we will read a responsive dialogue and commissioning. Um, my, my concern right now is if any of you would like to volunteer to light the Advent wreath, in weeks to come, would you please speak with me? And you don't have to do any speaking parts. It's simply lighting the candles. Thank you. Thanks. At this time, let us still our minds. Let us open our hearts. Let us prepare ourselves for a time of morning worship. Let us worship God. The Gospel of John speaks of Christ as the true light coming into the world. In commemoration of that coming, we light candles for the four weeks leading to Christmas and reflect on the coming of Christ. It is significant that the church has always used that language, the coming of Christ, because it speaks to a deep truth. Christ is coming. Christ is always coming always entering a troubled world, a wounded heart, and so we light the first candle, the candle of hope, and dare to express our longing for peace, for healing, and for the well-being of all creation. Loving God, as we enter this Advent season, we open all the dark places in our lives to the healing light of Christ. Show us the creative power of hope. Prepare our hearts to be transformed by you. Take time in the business of this season for quiet reflection. For the light of God's love is discernible everywhere. We will let ourselves be surprised by wonder and set aside time to offer. The good news of Advent is this. Christ is coming. Christ is always coming. We will welcome Christ into our hearts. We will let ourselves be guided by his ministry. We will go forth from this place in hope. The hymn of praise, 
is on page 11 in the Presbyterian hymnal. Prepare the way of the Lord. Let us make our confession to God. Let us pray. We sadly confess that we have done so little with so much. Forgive us, Lord, for not bending the knee, for not reading your word, for not searching our hearts, for not facing our sins. Forgive us according to your tender mercies, O God. Grant that when Christmas morning breaks for us this year, we may have a fresh sense of your presence and a renewed resolve to live in the praise of Christ's glory. Amen. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Your sins are pardoned. Penalty is paid. Please be seated. I would like to invite at this time any children who are worshiping with us to come forward for the children's message. And together, let us sing.
so great to see you guys here this morning and today. You may have noticed that we lit this candle over here. I noticed that you're looking at it already. And we've got a few other candles up here that we light each and every Sunday. That candle's on, that's right. And, and we do that because there's something really powerful. That candle's off right now, but you know what? I want to light it, so let's do this here. Right. Let's light that candle. You can hold it if you want. Okay, just be careful. So we have these candles here. And what we're doing with these candles, can you see it okay? Let's put it over here in the middle, okay? So both of you guys can see it. And what we do at this time of year is we light a candle, and then we end up lighting several candles to remind us that God is light. It could hurt you, yeah. Light light can hurt you if you get so close to it that it could burn you. If, If we get the light in our eyes too much, it might hurt us. But you know what? Just a little bit of light is enough to take care of all of the darkness, It was something interesting that I heard recently that if someone lights a candle and they put it up to 10 miles away, that's a really, really, really long way, that the human eye is able to see that candle flickering in the distance. How amazing is that? Just a little bit of light in the darkness is enough to illumine the way for us. Enough for us to see. And so what we do right now in this season of Advent is we we light a candle to remind us of God. That God's light is strong enough to overcome the darkness all around us. And when God's light is near, we never have to be afraid. Please bow your heads with me and let's say a word of prayer, okay? Dear God, we thank you for your light which shines brightly in the people around us, in the faces of parents and grandparents, in the faces of friends and in other people in our congregation. We thank you for all of the light and the goodness which is a part of our world. And we thank you for Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, who dispels all darkness in our midst. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming forward. You may go to your class. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will give what I have promised in the presence of all God's people. Will the ushers please come forward?
O God, most merciful and gracious, to whose bounty we have all received, accept this offering of your people. Remember in your love those who have brought it and those to, for whom it is given. And so follow it with your blessing that it may promote peace and goodwill among all people and advance the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen for God's word. Let us pray. O God, our beginning and end, by whose command time runs its course, bless our impatience, perfect our faith, and while we await the fulfillment of your promise, grant us hope in your word. Amen. First lesson is from Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, in days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of mountains, and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The word of the Lord.
Our second lesson this morning comes to us from Matthew's Gospel in the 24th chapter. I invite you now to hear the Word of God. Jesus said, but about that day and hour, no one knows. Neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Until the day Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Last week, I talked about one of the temptations that faithful people in churches, particularly all across the United States, but all across Europe as well, are facing as they look at what's generally been happening over the last 100 and particularly 50 years, as it seems to be getting harder and harder for places of worship to attract people into their settings. And and then all of a sudden there becomes this anxiety that people have. And they start looking at all the different ways that they might be able to get new people to come through their doors. And and pretty soon people are talking about uh, changes that need to happen, particularly um, more modern music. Or they start talking about programming that's directed toward particular age groups. And I was talking last week about how, though there's nothing inherently particularly wrong with either of those suggestions, of course, there's uh, always room for any church to broaden its view and its scope and to think about ways of reaching out to new people. But in the end, it's not ultimately the musical style. And it's not ultimately the programming that draws new people through the doors each and every week. What I said last week, and and I think it's worth repeating again here, is that it's finally about consistent, authentic faith that draws people of every age to come into this church and into churches near and far all across the world. It is consistent, authentic faith. All of those other things are just packaging. And it's not ultimately the packaging from which the church has been founded and from which the church has flourished. I mean, we've been doing this for 2,000 years, haven't we? Christianity is now the most populous faith on the planet in those 2,000 years. The packaging, that comes and goes with each and every generation. But what ultimately stays the same, where we ultimately find our rootedness as a people of God, is in the message and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. That is what we hold fast to. Everything else is just bells and whistles. Everything else is what we use to make that message known. With this in mind, I want to offer what may be sort of a difficult message on this first Sunday in Advent. If you're familiar with the church calendar, then you know as a preacher, this is the time where difficult messages 
can really come through, right? This is the season of watching and waiting and, and the season where we find prophetic figures like John the Baptist who comes onto the scene and who tells us to make the way straight for the Lord. This is the time when we're called to examine our hearts and our minds and to start thinking about who we are at our very core and to see if that is not only the person that we want to be, but the kind of person that God calls us to be. That's what Advent is really all about. And with all of this in mind, I've started thinking perhaps about where the rubber really hits the road for each and every one of us as postmodern people, as rational, scientific, enlightened kind of people. And I was thinking about how our modern or some might say postmodern sophistication really might be our greatest weakness of all when it comes to proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ in the here and now. And I want to tell you what I mean by that. As you know, modernity has taught us many different messages. It's taught us many different lessons over these past several hundred years. But according to some, none of those lessons has been driven home as much or as often as this one. That in time, we have not only heard again and again, but we have come to understand that every single deed, not only in our lives, but in the lives of every person around us, every single deed, even the most deviant of criminal acts, we've come to see these in, in certain terms as either psychologically bound or perhaps sociologically bound. Or we, we may think of them as the result of economic conditions, not only in communities, but in societies at large. Or we may think of when people make wrong turns and choose the wrong path. Sometimes we may think of that biologically as a response to environmental or genetic sorts of things that are going on in the world around us. Now, I'm certainly not anti-science. I think you know that. I think you know that the Presbyterian Church from the very beginning of its inception was very supportive of Darwin. Not only the Church of Scotland, but also Darwin, they were both doing their work in Scotland, in the same place, at the same time, and there was a great affirmation from the church about what was going on in the scientific world. But ultimately, I think what has happened over the last several hundred years is we have managed to explain away using rational, enlightened, scientific sort of language each and every motivation that could possibly be in existence for why we do the things that we really ought not to do. Do you understand what I'm saying there? Do you understand that Ultimately, in each and every one of us, sometimes when we make a misstep or a miscalculation or, or simply do the wrong thing, perhaps that's something that's rooted in our fallen nature, don't you think? Perhaps there still is the existence of sin and evil in the world around us as unpopular as those concepts may be. As sophisticated, enlightened people, this is not a very popular thing to say. In fact, many of us have been led to believe that if we talk about things like this in the context of the church, then we're just going to drive people away because, after all, the church has been laying guilt trips on people for centuries. So we might as well do away with all of that sin talk, right? Because in the end, that's not going to get us anywhere. That's one thing, I think, that our sophisticated nature lulls us into thinking. And the other point is, I think, kind of like it. 
that we, when we become as sophisticated as you and I are, then we also begin to explain away every good existence in our lives. Every, every good thing that happens in the world around us either becomes circumstance or coincidence or fate, right? We begin to say that, well, if you, you just work hard enough or just pick yourself up by your bootstraps, then ultimately your life is going to be successful. You're going to get ahead. Ultimately, what we're saying is it's all about me, right? And there's no room left for God. There's no room left for evil. And there's no room left for good. We are just individual agents going through life, making our own luck. Is that really what the church should be preaching in the here and now? Or do we still believe in a world in which evil exists? In which sometimes we need to be held accountable for our own actions? And which, at, and when at times we need to realize that our misguided attitudes about our success, well, in those times we can really point the finger at God and say that God gave us those gifts and those skills and those abilities and allowed us to live in a country like this where success was even possible. How much is really in our hands? And how much is in the hands of God? And I think that ultimately, deep down, what I'm really talking about here is what each and every one of us proclaims, not only of who God is, but about how God is at work in our lives. This, to me, is the real shortcoming of the postmodern church. Because even when we're out and about with our friends and our family and in our communities and having conversations, how often do we really bring our faith into those conversations? If someone is talking about psychology or sociology or economics or whatever the subject may be, we will dive right in. But we're not willing to touch faith with a 10-foot pole. And why do you think it is that in the midst of those conversations, then we come together and we say, you know what? It seems like the church is kind of going backwards. It sort of seems like the pews are a little bit more empty than they were 50 years ago. Well, you know what we need to do? We need to change up the way that we're presenting our music, right? Maybe we need to have the music be a little bit more hip. Or maybe what we really need is, is some different programming, you know, to reach out to some of those younger people that we would love to see coming through our doors. Is that what it's really about? Is it about the packaging? Or is it about the messaging? The message that has come into our lives so deeply and so profoundly that we can't help but go forth and to proclaim that gospel to our family and to our friends and to our neighbors, even if they look at us like we're crazy. And we all know that they will. We can't expect the church to be successful if we are not the witnesses, if we are not proclaiming what we already say that we believe. It's a wonderful start that each and every one of us are here on a Sunday morning. It is a wonderful start that each and every one of us are feeling something that that tugs us and brings us back to this place because we know that there is a God and we want that God to be recognized in the world around us. But it is finally only a start. And I think that ultimately where the church and people like me have failed each and every one of you over these past several generations is that we've presented the idea that if we simply open the door 
on Sunday mornings and tell everybody what time the service is going to be, then people are going to come. We have done you a great disservice by feeding you that message. Ultimately, what the church needs to be doing and what the church ought to have done is to equip each and every one of you to be disciples. And the way that we do that is by letting you know that you have a story to tell, that you are agents in this drama, explaining how God is at work in your life. And no matter what your age and what your story, when you present it authentically and consistently as a person of God, other people of every age will find that attractive. And they will want to come and to be a part of that gospel that you are proclaiming because you are a representative of Jesus Christ in the world. So with all of this in mind, I've been wrestling with different topics over this past year. Some of you may know that I'm currently in the midst of doctoral work at Columbia Theological Seminary. This is not a PhD, it's not a terminal degree, it's not a teaching degree. It's a doctor of ministry, it's a program that is giving me more skills and continuing to equip me for ministry in your midst. And as a part of that work, I was challenged to pick a topic that might relate to the entire congregation and that might strengthen us and move us forward together. And so after struggling with a number of different topics, I thought that perhaps the most pressing concern in this church and any other church in the postmodern period is the idea of testimony. Where is it that God is at work in our lives and how do we effectively communicate that message to the people around us. So I presented this idea to the session. And either because they liked it or because they trust me, they went along with the idea. And so in the coming year, we're going to have a number of workshops. These workshops are going to be focusing on how we can be attentive to how God is at work in our lives. That's the first step, isn't it? You can't really go and proclaim how God is at work in your life unless you're able to see God at work in your life. So we're going to do some very creative things. We're going to use poetry and drama and music, and we're going to talk about things like what is a Christian vocation? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ in the world today? And we're going to start weaving all of these threads together so that at the end of that year, we will have some very concrete things that we can say here at St. James about how God is at work in our midst. And then the hope, of course, is that that will just be the starting point for us to go out into the world and to say, look, Look at what God is doing among us. What God has done isn't just limited to the biblical text. It wasn't just limited to what was happening just before the enlightenment. No, what God is doing continues to happen. It is forever evolving. And it is in our midst right here, right now. That is the exciting and awesome message of the gospel that we have the privilege of proclaiming. Our second lesson this morning talks about how we never know when Christ will come again. We never know when Jesus is going to come again into our midst. We simply need to be ready. And for centuries, that is the Advent message that we have been proclaiming. Prepare yourselves. Don't just trim the tree. Don't just put up the lights. Don't just make sure that all of the food is in order. But prepare yourselves. Prepare your souls. Prepare your hearts and your imaginations that God can be doing something new even now. 
I invite you to think about that as we share this feast that's been prepared for us. And I invite you to think about that as we think about the coming kingdom of God in which that feast is presented for all of us. The feast at which we are all invited. Come, all things are now ready. May it be so. And all thanks be to God, both now and forever. Amen. Please stand and join with me in the singing of our hymn. Please be seated. And as we prepare to celebrate this sacrament, I will remind you of a few joys and concerns in our own community. As a pastor, it's always a wonderful thing to be able to share the joys and the great things that are happening in our midst. And so today I give thanks that Candy Ellis has had a successful surgery. She was even ushering this morning. Her surgery was just this past Monday. So we give thanks and praise for the success of that operation. In addition, I heard from Jim Harden. His wife, Louise, had surgery on Tuesday for colon cancer. He left me a message saying that this is the best Thanksgiving he's had in a very long time. Doctors are telling him that they removed all of the cancer and that things are looking very good. So he's very excited and hopeful about what is to come. We're thankful as well as I look around the room and see who is here among us. Rook Van Helm, after a very difficult surgery that he had several months ago and uh, lots of trying uh, things that had to be done to get him to this point. Oh, he would like to speak. Yeah, let me, let me bring a mic around to him just a second. I have a few things to say, and I don't want to make a sermon out of it. In the first place, I would like to thank all your prayers because they were with me. I thank you for who visited me. Uh, 
the ones that don't know, I had six and a half hours of surgery, four surgeons on my intestines, four surgeons on my uh, hernia. After surgery, I had no pain until now, no pain. And it was the Lord that took care of me. And I don't want to repeat your sermon, but <laughs> my daughter had a car accident 50 years ago. And I gave everything over to the Lord that he would take care of my, us. This time, I did the same thing. But it was more intense because I had already a lot of bricks. But this time, the Lord cemented all those bricks together. And I am so thankful. And again, thanks, congregation, for your thoughts, your prayers, and let's pray for each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruk. We're so glad that you're back with us for the first time after that surgery. In addition, there was a prayer card for someone that's been on our hearts and minds lately, uh, the Beatties, following a very, very terrible and tragic car accident involving their youngest son. Uh, he's been in the hospital in a coma now for a number of weeks. Alice, if you're not familiar with our congregation, serves as the clerk of session here, which is uh, basically the highest lay position that anyone uh, can hold in the life of our church. And so, uh, you know, we're just surrounding them with uh, our deepest hopes and uh, with our greatest longings as they continue to walk through this path that has now been put in their midst. At this time, let us prepare ourselves to receive this sacrament by hearing these words of invitation. Come to this table, you who have much faith, and you who would like to have more. You who have been to this sacrament often, and you who have not been for a long time. You who have tried to follow Jesus, and you who have failed. Come, it is Christ who invites us to meet him here. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give thanks and praise. Loving God, you made this world for us to enjoy. You gave us Jesus to be our Savior and friend and to bring us to you. You sent your spirit to make us one family in Christ. For these gifts of your love, we thank you. And we join with angels and saints in this holy hymn of praise. Together, please join me. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And now, lest we believe that our praise alone fulfills your purpose, we fall silent and remember him who came, because words were not enough. Setting our wisdom, our will, our words aside, emptying our hearts and bringing nothing in our hands we yearn for the healing, the holding, the accepting, the forgiving that Christ alone can offer. And so we ask now that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that we may know Christ's presence real and true and be his faithful followers showing your love for the world. Please join me through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, forever. Amen.
Would you please join me in offering the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, the Lord Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it, saying, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is for you. As often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. For every time that you eat of this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, these are the gifts of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite the communion servers to please come forward at this time. And I would like to remind you that as is the custom of this worshiping community, those seated at the back of the sanctuary will be served first. All of the cups contain grape juice. All of the bread is gluten-free. We invite you to come forward as soon as the elements have been distributed to the communion servers. All things are now ready.
invite you to please find your bulletin and join with me in our prayer following communion. We bless you, O God, for gifts of bread and cup, for sustaining us in hope every day of our lives. We pray for your strength to prepare us now for your service as we offer to you lives of witness and worship in the world you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand one more time as you are able for the singing of our closing hymn. I invite you now to receive this blessing. It is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us share signs of God's peace.